Hello, and welcome to the webinar, the uh, Western Governors Association webinar, Innovative Approaches to Addressing Forest Health and Invasive Species in the Pacific Islands. This is a webinar um, as part of a webinar series for the Western Governors Association Biosecurity and Invasive Species Initiative. The Biosecurity Invasive Species Initiative was launched um, as the signature chair initiative of Hawaii Governor David Ige in July of 2018. The um, purpose of the initiative is to focus on the impacts that nuisance species, pests, and pathogens have on ecosystems, forests, rangelands, watersheds, and infrastructure in the West, and to examine the role that biosecurity plays in addressing these risks. And what we mean by biosecurity and in, um, invasive species initiative is biosecurity being the set of measures and practices and principles being taken by a wide variety of invasive species managers to prevent new species from moving into, into the west, into the country, into a state, into an island, into whatever region of jurisdiction that makes the most sense. And then um, invasive species management, it's all the good work that's being done by um, folks to manage, control, eradicate, do what they can uh, once the uh, species have been detected or established. To accomplish the goal of the initiative, uh, we have, we're spending a year listening to st a wide variety of stakeholders and experts on these issues. We, we started that with a, a webinar on, in July of 2018 that's available on WGA's website at westgov.org in which Governor Ige um, sort of gave us a keynote and set up the, the outline, the goals of the initiatives. That was followed by a series of workshops throughout the West, one in Nevada hosted by Governor Brian Sandoval, one in Wyoming hosted by Governor Matt Mead, one in Montana hosted by Governor Steve Bullock, and the final one in December of 2018 in Hawaii hosted by Governor David Ige. Throughout these uh, one to one and a half day workshops, we heard from a wide variety of invasive species experts and biosecurity experts on a, a number of topics about invasive species. And um, we collected all the recommendations that we heard as part um, to build up and contribute towards a final report that we will be releasing in June 2018 as part of the initiative. And um, but one thing we learned is that through this process and through all those workshops, we there were still some questions that we had unanswered. And that's what the webinars are for, and that's what this webinar series is for: is to really um, look at some of the issues that arose during the workshops that are um, really deserved more attention and deserved a deeper dive than um, they were given and just to really sort of get at the really interesting um, policy questions going on in the West going on in invasive species management. And that's what uh, um, has led us today. We've had, this is the, um, we've had a series of uh, webinars about uh, throughout the initiative and this one is focusing on biosecurity and islands. Um, WGA, uh, we are 22 uh, there are 22 members of the Western Governors Association, and among, among them are the governors of Guam, um, uh, American Samoa, and the Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands. So um, what uh, is going on in islands in terms of forestry and invasive species management is really of interest to us, uh, largely because um, islands are the most susceptible to invasive species in many ways. Uh, as closed ecosystems, there uh, are there's there so much attention needs to be paid to biosecurity and invasive species, and there's a lot of challenges associated with that. But there's also a lot of opportunity associated with that. As um, invasive species managers and islands know, um, due to geographic isolation, they are really often coming up with the most innovative um, and creative and important innovations in biosecurity invasive species management. Um, when you work in a closed ecosystem like that, you really have to um, you really have to be on top of things, you have to think on your feet, and you have to adapt. And uh, that is what we're here to talk about today. We've got um, uh, a, a group of experts who in um, both invasive species management and also in forestry, um, a, a large emphasis on Forestry and the relations uh, between invasive species management and forestry, uh, those two are hardly, uh, they cannot be separated really, especially in work on islands. And um, I'm really excited about the folks we have here today to talk about that. And the goal really is just to, um, for the panelists to share uh, what it is that they are doing and what it is that they would like um, managers on the, the mainland to understand about what it is that they're, um, the, the situations that they're operating under and also just to teach 
uh, mainland invasive species and forestry managers about what that they are doing that could benefit the best practices and the things they're doing that could benefit um, invasive species managers and for, uh, forest managers on the mainland. So um, before we, uh, the format that we'll be doing is we're going to start, um, we're going to move through um, the panelists and then we'll start with a 10 minute presentation uh, from each panelist and then we'll move through to a um, finish the webinar with some moderated discussion with me, your moderator. And uh, I am, to introduce myself, I'm Bill Whitaker. I'm a policy advisor for uh, forest range and invasive species management for the Western Governors Association, and I'm the lead on the Biosecurity Invasive Species Initiative. So I'm really, um, really excited about this webinar. I think it's um, a really interesting topic, and I'm glad we're going to be able to, uh, to t discuss some of these issues. So before we begin, um, I'd just also like to, um, a quick moment of recognition to Sarah Goodwin from the Council of Western State Foresters. Sarah helped us pull together this uh, webinar and has just been a great resource for us and extremely helpful. So um, thank you, Sarah, for all the work that you do and all the work that you did pulling this together. So with that, I am now going to turn the uh, webinar over to our panelists. Um, and in the order that they'll be speaking in, we are joined today by Susan Cordell. She is the director uh, for the Institute of Pacific Island Forestry for the U.S. Forest Service. She'll be followed by Pua Michael, the head forester for the Division of Forestry at the Palau uh, Bureau of Agriculture, followed by DJ Sen um, from American Samoa Community College, the Department of Agriculture, Community and Natural Resources, and finally by Chelsea Muna Brecht, the Director of the Guam Department of Agri Agriculture. And uh, with that, I will turn, I will now hand the webinar over to our first panelist, Susan Cordell, who will um, share with us some of the work that she's doing with, with the Forest Service. So, Susan, take it away. Great. Thank you, Bill. Aloha, everyone. It's great to be here. And I'm just going to move on to the next slide here. So I just want to start off with um, introducing our institute. I'm with the, the USDA Forest Service, and we're part of the Pacific Southwest Research Station. And we have an Institute of Pacific Island Forestry that's in Hilo, Hawaii. Uh, we've been there almost 60 years serving Hawaii and the Pacific Islands. And you can see on this map here, this is the geographic representation of our area of responsibility. So it's quite large. It's an area approximately the size of the continental U.S. with about 130 inhabited islands and greater than 15 uh, native languages. We have a staff of about 20 Forest Service employees and an additional 30 to 40 partners that work out of our institute uh, to meet our goals. Um, we also have a, a, a biocontrol facility to deal with invasive plant species, and we have a quarantine facility um, to do that as well. Okay, uh, before I get too far into this, I just want to let everyone know the threats that we're facing and, and the resource management issues that we're facing in our area of responsibility. And if I take you through the pictures here, you can see on the top there, there's a a, a lot of sedimentation going um, from the land into, into rivers or into the ocean. And that's a big problem and mostly a result of land degradation and land changes um, in Hawaii and Pacific Islands. And some of the responsibility for those are uh, wildfire, um, especially during the dry seasons across these islands, we're um, getting a bigger and bigger wildfire problem. And you can see the, the um, slide with uh, the tall invasive tree species, that's um, a tree species called Albizia. It's one of the fastest growing trees in the world and a huge threat to Hawaii and Pacific Islands. And then the top slide with the beautiful waterfall is sort of showing how we anticipate climate change to be impacting our islands. So you can see um, a nice beautiful waterfall on one side and then the other side with it dry. So drought is a big part of what we're likely to see in the future out here. And just some sort of socio-cultural um, 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 discussion about how we work in Hawaii and the U.S. affiliated Pacific Islands. It's quite different than um, obviously a lot of other forests across the continental United States. We don't have national forests um, in these areas, so we work primarily in um, collaboration with the state and state foresters. Um, so that makes us quite unique. Um, and many times people think that um, Hawaii is very similar to Western Pacific Islands, and that's not the case. Every, every place is very unique. And we need to be mindful of that. Um, many areas have provisional governments and territories. 
The forestry resources are quite low. You'll probably hear more about that later um, today. And there's a lot of military influence that can also affect our natural resource management capability in these areas. There's other governments to think about, such as um, tribal governments and, and historic governments that we need to be mindful of. And then climate change is differentially affecting this geographic area quicker than many other areas around the world. Uh, we also need to recognize social, social and cultural ties. Um, the history of the Hawaiian Islands and the overthrow is still sitting in people's minds, and we need to be very mindful that, that we're working in this landscape. Many people have ancestral ties to natural resources and to the ocean, and often the way we might go about managing these resources is quite different from their historical way of doing it. Um, we also have a, what we call in Hawaii an ahupua'a land management system. So instead of discrete parcels of land, the land is managed from the top of the mountain to the ocean. And this also includes an agroforestry component. So forested lands were equally as important as agroforestry landscapes where you had a mixture of food crops as well as native forest crops. People in islands live in discrete, with discrete boundaries. We're all used to this. We all have to get along, and we all have to deal with each other, even if we disagree with each other. Otherwise, you have to leave. <laughs> That's just the way it is. And we know that resources are finite. We see them. We live from raindrop to faucet, from ridge to reef. And in Hawaii, we call this Malka to Makai. So just to give you some background, I know this is an invasive species platform, but really invasive species are set in a context of disturbance regimes that we all face. And so nothing, it, nothing sits alone. Invasive species are the result of many other factors. So the research themes that we focus on at our institute are basically trying to understand landscape change. And this includes invasive species. It includes climate change. The second research theme that we really emphasize at the institute is trying to find strategies and tools to deal with this landscape change. And the third one is this island biocultural science and stewardship, and that's a bit of what I talked about earlier, that we need to be mindful of the way people view landscapes, and invasive species are not different from this. Sometimes invasive species have become important culturally, and we need to be mindful of how we move forward in dealing with that. So here's just some examples of current research that we're doing. Um, this is primarily in Hawaii. I'll talk a little more about the Pacific in a, in a little bit. Um, we have a lot of in invasive plant pathogens, and the, the most devastating one right now is a, a fungal pathogen, Ceratocystis, that's causing what we're calling rapid ohia death. And ohia is the, the, the main species, the main forest species across Hawaii, and it's beloved both for its ecosystem service as well as culturally. And we have this fungal pathogen that's impacting that, so a lot of our resources are going to deal with this at the moment. Um, we also have an emphasis on development of biocontrol agents for ecosystem altering invasive plants. We have another emphasis where we're trying to understand carbon fluxes in our ecosystem so that we can have robust baselines and perhaps get into the carbon market to help us support our natural resource management, including combating invasive species. Um, climate change, as I mentioned, is really affecting us, and plant invasion um, is going to be a big part of this this story, um, and so trying to understand the relationship between those two. We also have an emphasis on looking at threatened and endangered plant species that often are declining as a result of invasive species. As I mentioned, the second theme that we focus on is development of tools. So we're looking at different ways to approach restoration, and this restoration is so that these ecosystems can give us the services we need but also reduce the likelihood of invasive, new and additional invasive species. Um, we've had some success using scent dogs for the early detection of pathogens, and this has been pretty exciting for us, and we'd like to further uh, go down this pathway to understand how valuable uh, this could be. We're also developing decision support tools, and that can also include managing invasive species um, across landscapes and then working with site-specific restoration um, strategies for de degraded ecosystems. They can, these can differ quite, um, they, they have quite a broad range depending on the type of ecosystem you're restoring. And again, looking at future clim climate models to understand how we need to move into the future for restoration. And then we're also starting to get into landscape genomics and other indicators of resistance 
to identify suitable varieties of native species um, for a changing climate. And then the third one is this biocultural science stewardship. And, and this one's a little bit harder for people to wrap their minds around what this actually means. But we're trying to do more community-based restoration and, and community-based stewardship of our natural resources so that we're not operating in a bubble, that we have um, community commitments to understand what we're doing and to help and add knowledge and value to these um, approaches. Um, this is also happening um, in, in Micronesia, for example. We have someone there that's working on um, trying to do agriculture with the influence of saltwater intrusion into the agroecosystems. And then one of the most important things with, um, in, that, that related to invasive species is this question of biological control and um, large-scale reduction of invasive species that we need to be mindful that everyone has different opinions and different comfort levels with sometimes these large-scale um, attempts to remove species. Even if they are invasive in our mind, they have value to some people. And then we're, we've started what we call a halal, which is a school or academy, where us Western scientists and land managers are getting together with traditional um, um, cultural practitioners and talking and having bi-directional information flow so that we both understand um, what's of importance to each of us. And this has been incredibly valuable. And now I'll talk a little bit about the work that we're doing in the Pacific. Mostly what I talked about previously was Hawaii, so I'll just move right into this. Um, one of the things that we've been looking at is the dynamics of Pacific Island resources, and the emphasis of this work is done in Palau, which you'll hear more about later. So in order to understand what's going on, we needed to, to sort of look at the history of landscape, landscape change in this area. And as it, you can see from this map, in 1921, um, the island of Babeldaob, which is the large island in, in the Republic of Palau, was primarily forested. You can see that looks like about 80% forest cover there. And then um, right following World War II in 1947, you can see the landscape was substantially altered um, with a lot of farmland across the landscape. And then going back to t up to 2006, you can see that reforestation or forest recovery was quite impressive. Um, and you can see mostly changes in urban um, settlements um, during this time. And so it's really interesting to, to know this and to know that forest recovery is possible when disturbance regimes um, are uh, reduced. We also have scientists working and looking at climate change. Um, and mangrove forests are one of the um, areas where we're going to likely see the impact of climate change and sea level rise very quickly. Soon, and the ecological services that mangroves provide are substantial, and primarily a lot to do with protection against storms and other things. And so, looking to show showing the value of mangroves in these systems um, is is really important. And so, we have a scientist. You can see the bars here. They're actually measuring sea the sea level rise um, over time, and these are being set up all across the Pacific, so that we'll have a, an understanding of um, the, where this is happening and where we can focus our efforts on in restoration efforts on into the future. Um, this is uh, invasive species work that we've done in um, American Samoa. And this is the tree I mentioned earlier, the Falcataria malucana, the Albizia tree. It's an incredibly fast growing ecosystem altering tree species. It's nitrogen fixing and, and really gets out of hand quickly. And it was starting to take over forested areas of, of American Samoa. And with one of our scientists, they developed a very easy method to go in and, and kill these trees and remove them from the landscape. And uh, the, the foresters in the National Park in Samoa just really got into this. And they've pretty much completely eradicated Albizia from American Samoa. So it's a very impressive. Um, story of um, invasive species removal. And then the graph here you can see um, on the right, this is the um, accumulation of native tree biomass after removal. And you can see this is megagrams per hectare. And 10 years following the removal of this tree, you can see the green line is the baseline value of forest biomass. And you can see that, that uh, the, the biomass of native trees have already bounced back to um, areas where um, Albizia didn't exist. So this is a real success story showing that with the effort and dedication, you can actually um, eradicate a species from islands. 
And then as I mentioned, fire is a huge issue that we're dealing with because what happens is these fires are not, um, they're not natural in these systems. These are all human caused. And so because they're human caused, they can be human stopped. <laughs> this is sort of our idea. And so the first thing we wanted to do is see how big of an issue that fire is in this region. So we've been mapping fires since 2012 in Palau and 2015 in Guam, and we're starting to do it in Yap as well. And you can see by this, gra uh, this figure, and this always surprises people, particularly in the mainland, um, this is percent land area burned annually. And you can see that Western U.S., about 1% of the land burns annually. But if you look over at Guam, this can sometimes get up to 10% of the landscape burning on an annual basis. So it's a very critical problem um, that, that we're facing here. And if you look at the different colors on the maps, these uh, represent different years of fire. So we're trying to understand, is this related to um, uh, climate variables such as drought, and certainly it is, but now with anticipated drought, with climate change, we're anticipating fire to become even more of a problem. So we're really trying to make uh, increase awareness of this problem um, out in the Pacific, because once you get a fire in these areas, you tend to not get native species recovering in these areas. It tends to go more in the opposite direction to a more degraded landscape. And so if you catch it after one or two fires, maybe you can have luck with restoration. But after three or four fires, it starts to go into sort of a, a, a very degraded, compact soil. You can see in Guam where most of this fire activity is occurring is in the south. And you can see a um, ex really extensive part of the landscape burning here. And then finally, um, talking about recovery of tropical forests, we know from those landscape change maps I showed you at the beginning that these forests are, can recover quickly, but how do they recover and how does that impact biodiversity? So we've established a permanent plot um, as part of the Smithsonian Forest Geo Plot. This is very intensive forest dynamic monitoring, monitoring where we can look at um, species mortality and growth rates and then also using indicator species such as orchids to understand um, biodiversity, how biodiversity recovers after change. We're also measuring climate, as you can see by the station there, so we can correlate these growth and mortality rates to climate. So this will be great forest inventory data um, for Palau to understand how their forests are changing. And just to give you a little idea of how, how Palau fits into the rest of the world, this is a a, species, a graph that has number of species present, and then the plot location code on the bottom there, and those are all across the world. The, for example, um, Lambier is in India. Um, you can see Palau there in the green, and then next to those are Hawaii. So you can see that Hawaii has very species low, um, very low species diversity. Palau has three times the number of tree species um, in Hawaii, but you can see how low it is compared to, to other tropical forests around the world. So just in summary of what we're doing, hopefully I've conveyed to you that small islands really pose unique natural management resource needs. And because of this, small islands require unique solutions. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Susan. That was uh, very interesting. That's certainly a uh, diverse um, type of work you're doing, a really important work and a diverse um, Set of conditions and areas. So I, I thought that was very, uh, very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. And then next, we turn over to Pua Michael, the head forester for the Division of Forestry for the Palau Bureau of Agriculture. So, Pua. Hi. Good afternoon or early evening to you all. Um, so I'm from the Republic of Palau. We are in the westernmost part of Micronesia. It's approximately 300 miles east of the Philippines. Uh, our total population is about 20,000, 5,000 of which are composed of uh, foreign workers. So um, because of our location, we have a lot of common pests with some of the Asian countries and the Pacific Islands, and this is mainly due to the importation of goods. Um, we import, uh, I would have to say, about 90% of our food, uh, construction materials, to cars, we do a lot of importing of goods. Um, some of the challenges that we face on our islands, we have very bad soils. They're clay soils, very high in aluminum, 
and they provide very harsh conditions for the, for our plants to grow in. Um, another issue that we also have is land tenure or ownership. Um, me working for the national government, I have, or the national government in Palau does not own any land. Um, they either are owned by the states, which we call public lands, or privately owned by families, clans, or just individuals. So if, if they have an issue on their land that we see is an issue, forest health issue, um, if we wanted to fix it and they don't want us to come in there, then we, have, we, we can't do it. So that's one of the, the main issues right now that's going on back home. Um, so some of the, the things that the, we're doing to tackle these challenges, uh, we have the green fee. Um, it's uh, actually a, deep, a, a tax that uh, our Congress passed to help with our protected areas network. Um, the green fee is collected. It's now built into the ticket price to come to Palau. So I think it's $100 now that goes into a, a protected area network fund. And um, so throughout Palau, there are protected areas, marine and terrestrial. Each of those protected areas have management plans and they have budgets, so that, that pot of money is available to those protected areas to, to help manage those areas. And it's a sustainable financing scheme, so it's, um, it's something that's working really good now. Um, they're looking into ways to expand outside of their protected areas um, so that the threats don't come into the protected areas. So some of the partnerships that uh, that are that is very valuable to us is of course the U.S. Forest Service, and then we also have the Regional Invasive Species Council, which is um, it's Micronesia wide. Um, we are working with the rest of Micronesia to ensure that the invasive species in, let's say, Guam doesn't get to Palau or, or vice versa. So that, that's one of, the, um, one of the ways that we've uh, been working with invasive species, working with the other islands, making sure that we know what's where and making sure that they don't come into places that don't have them yet, like, uh, for example, the, the brown tree snake in Guam which we don't want in Palau yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that, that's about it I have for Palau. That's great. Thank you, Pua. That's really interesting to hear about the work that's going on, particularly about the green fee. I've, I've heard about that. Um, at, I've read about that at various places, but it's really interesting to learn about. Um, that really seems to me like a great source of funding, and that's really fascinating to learn about. And just additionally, how it strikes me how different the land management, um, the ownership is from a lot of Western states and sort of the different uh, then context you have to work in. So uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, it's definitely very interesting. And next, we're turning over to DJ Sen uh, with American, the American Samoa Community College Department of Agriculture, Community, and Natural Resource Division. So DJ, go ahead. Hi, uh, Talofa. This is DJ. Um, Thank you for this opportunity. Um, it's good to share knowledge and information from other islands. Um, so thank you again for this webinar. Um, American Samoa is located approximately 2,560 miles southwest of the state of Hawaii. It consists of five main islands and two tall atolls. As of now, the human population is 55,000 give or take, with a total land area of 199 square kilometers, or about 78 square miles. Um, geography affects invasive species and forest health through various ways, ranging from the importation of products to limited, accesses, limited access for control due to steep topography, acquisition of forest health supplies from the U.S. mainland due to shipping costs, and so on. Like the majority, if not all, of the Pacific Islands, the main forest health challenge is invasive species. Um, 
in addition to that, land conversion and natural disasters, specifically cyclones, um, also contribute to these forest health challenges. Last year, February, we got hit by Tropical Storm Gita, and this one was a significant one because there was no warning issued, so we weren't really prepared for it. With that being said, the, um, our montane and urban forests were severely damaged, which resulted in falling on homes and personal properties. Invasive species play a huge role in these challenges because of their direct influence. For example, after every cyclone, Invasive species, um, especially the Mycania, or what we call back in American Samoa, for Sanger, um, an invasive vine tends to increase and populate over damaged forested areas, making it difficult for native plants to grow. Um, other invasive species, such as the uh, Trustila elastica, or Mexican rubber tree, um, African tulip tree, um, and as Susan mentioned, the Albizia and the newly introduced invasive in American Samoa called the Little Fire Ant um, is a major and serious threat to our forest health and ecosystems. Aside from that, another challenge we are facing in American Samoa is a need for a forestry researcher to conduct and assist forest health projects, um, educate extension programs, um, on any new data regarding our forest health and so on. Um, there are only two agencies that actually target invasive species at a terrestrial scale. Um, one is the program I managed, uh, the forestry program at the local community college, and the second is the National Park Service of American Samoa. I can't speak on National Park's behalf or any information regarding their uh, services or agency. But at the forestry program, we receive funding from the U.S. Forest Service and work closely um, with the previous forest health coordinator, David Bakke, and other managers or researchers from the U.S. Forest Service Region 5 program. In general, I would say that funding local policies and partnerships um, or like uh, limited communications or meetings with our partnerships from other islands or in the U.S. mainland are some of the major issues um, that we face. Um, we collaborate with the National Park Service in controlling various invasive species. Um, overall, we both serve the same purpose and goals in controlling and preventing these species from growing. Um, in summary, American Samoa has done a bit well in controlling invasive species, but our job is not done. Um, at this time, I would like to thank our federal and off-island partners, such as the U.S. Forest Service, Region 5, uh, Susan and the Institute of Pacific Islands Forestry, Sarah Goodwin and the Western Forestry Leadership Coalition, and all our federal fellow uh, Pacific Islanders for any support or assistance given to American Samoa Community College Forestry Program and to the forests of American Samoa. Thank you. Thank you, DJ. Um, I was sorry to hear that the little fire ant is in American Samoa. We, as part of the WGA workshop we had in Hawaii, there was a panel that discussed that, and that is um, really an unpleasant invasive species. So I'm um, sorry, to, sorry to hear that you've got uh, that has made its way to American Samoa and good luck tackling that. But um, definitely interesting um, le to learn about some of the uh, unique challenges in dealing with um, invasive species and how that affects forestry in American Samoa. So thank you very much. And then uh, now we will turn to our final uh, presenter, and that's Chelsea Munya Brecht. From, she's the director of the Guam Department of Agriculture. So Chelsea, go ahead. Hi, Hafide, thank you so much for allowing us to participate. Um, it's pretty exciting uh, to have <clears throat> to get uh, to participate in this conversation given that um, I think just about a month or two ago we had our Guam Invasive Species Council meeting and then just a week ago we had our Regional Invasive Species Council meeting on Guam where we had our, um, our brothers and sisters from our neighboring islands Islands come and in the council uh, meeting to discuss how we would approach 
um, invasive species regionally. Um, and Hawaii is actually part of that group as well. Um, so I've prepared a presentation on some of the invasive species we're dealing with um, on Guam right now. And I want to preface this with the fact that in a 2002 forest survey, um, the top three forest species on Guam were the coconut, um, the Cycas mi micronesca, which is our fatang, and the palma brava, which is an imported ornamental. Um, and today, two of those top three are being killed by the coconut rhinoceros beetle, and the third is being decimated by the Asian cycad scale. So our top three forest uh, species trees from 2002 are facing just annihilation with um, trying to survive invasive species. And so I'd just like to you know, take a moment to think about that and what that does, losing your top three species, what that would do to your landscape, let alone the ecosystem that thrives with that. Um, so with that in mind, the presentations oh, we have, um, the first picture is the Cycas micronesca, our fatang. Um, and this is what the fatang looks like when it's healthy. And this is what it looks like after the Asian cycad beetle. Or I'm sorry, Asian cycad scale. And that's the wonderful, lovely Asian cycad scale. Um, so let me go back to that for just a quick second. Um, we've lost 90% of our fatang population in a matter of just a few years. And what we have um, that we're trying as a biocontrol is the lady, the lady beetle, also known as the ladybird beetle. The problem is that the beetle only eats the scale on mature plants. So although we're trying to repopulate, seedlings are still attacked by the cycad scale and they die. So we're working um, with our partners at the University of Guam College of Natural and Applied Sciences Cooperative Extension to identify um, different biocontrol insects that may be able to address this and help our um, the young seedlings survive. And I do want to mention that the partners we work with um, who've been just um, invaluable and instrumental in helping Guam set up our biosecurity system to be as developed as it is right now um, are the University of Guam College of Natural and Applied Sciences and our Guam Customs and Quarantine uh, Division, as well as the USDA APHIS um, personnel who work hand-in-hand -hand with all of us, um, helping to ensure that we have up-to-date training and equipment that we need to work with um, these invasive species. So what you're looking at next, is the coconut tree. Um, on Guam, we call it the nizuk or trunco nizuk. Um, and I'm sure you're all familiar with um, what has been happening to our coconut trees, as I know it affects a lot of our neighboring islands. Um, these are coconut trees damaged by the coconut rhinoceros beetle. And so what we've been doing in terms of treatment for the coconut rhinoceros beetle have been both biocontrols and mechanic, uh, mechanical controls. Um, we have bucket traps and we use a fungus application. So the fungus is applied into the breeding traps and the beetles enter the trap to lay eggs and exit covered in a fungus which eventually kills them. It takes about five days to a week to kill them after exposure. And if you've ever seen the fungus take effect on the rhino beetle or the rhino beetle larva, um, it actually is pretty graphic, and at one point I commented to um, a good friend, Roland Kitagua, that it almost made me feel bad for the rhino beetle, but that was almost, because then I, all I had to do was look at a coconut tree and all the, you know, those other feelings came back up. Um, our University of Guam Cooperative Extension is actually exploring new viruses as another biocontrol method, and we give um, mechanical alternatives to our community to try to help reduce the population. 
And so what you'll see in this picture is a netting system that we use to apply over green waste because we have a lot of green waste generated on the island just from natural occurrences of branches falling off trees or people um, trimming their yards or landscape management um, practices. So we have been teaching the community to use these nets that have um, squares that are one inch or less in size so that the beetle can't crawl out of it um, because they fly into the netting or into the green waste and try to lay eggs um, or their larva, but they can't fly out because they, they can't crawl out. They need to fly in order to get out of the net and the netting size reduces the amount of space they have for their wingspan. So then they stay inside, which allows us to sort of control their population um, that way. And there's also a barrel method that utilizes the same idea, which keep with keeping it covered with um, a chicken wire, but with the same small space. And the next tree to come up is one of my favorites. It's the breadfruit um, or lemai tree, which we all in all of our islands use as a staple um, food product. And this is our breadfruit tree under attack of the Felinus noxious, um, also known as the black sock disease or brown root rot disease. And this is the Felinus noxious itself. Um, Felinus infects a number of hardwood trees, but lemai is also susceptible and is a major concern for all islands as this is um, a staple crop. And it also affects avocado trees. What happens is that the fungus encircles the base of the tree and moves upward, forming a sort of stalking, which is where it gets its name. And this leads to foliage, um, loss of foliage and weakened tissue. So our treatment have been mechanical. Um, infested trees need to be dug up and burned. And one um, potential, I guess, treatment methodology that was just brought up in a conversation today, which I would need to run through our entomologist and invasive species coordinator is that when we're facing grassland fires on parts of the island and there are trees that are attacked by the Felinus noxious within those areas, um, you can have up to the, the, disease, the bacteria spread up to 30 different trees at a time. So if there are trees in an area of a grassland fire, something that was proposed for consideration was um, when the fire is put out in general, allowing the um, the underburn to sort of put itself or die, die out itself so that it burns through the roots of the tree and underneath so that it would kill any pathogens that remained in the soil. Um, but I don't know about the effectiveness of that. Um, that would be something that we discussed with our uh, biosecurity division. The next tree um, is our ironwood tree, the gagu tree, and this is affected by bacterial wilt um, the, the wilt is the disease caused by the bacterial infection, um, and this is the bacterial infection within the heartwood. And then we have our banana tree, and I think this is something that most people are familiar with on our islands, which is the rot on bananas caused by Fusarium, which is the bunchy top virus. And this is caused by an aphid, so once the plant becomes infected, all subsequent shoots of the plants will be will carry the virus, and the aphids must be killed, and then the entire plant and corm dug up. Um, UOG and the Department of Agriculture partnered to produce um, disease-free tissue, tissue culture banana stock, which is available at the Department of Agriculture, and we've been disseminating this into the community for a few years now. Um, so we have trees that are cultivated through tissue culture, um, and then shared with the community that are not susceptible or disease-free. And then uh, branching out of the area of plant um, disease, we have our pests, which are like the greater, greater banded hornet. Um, the only treatment we have really for the hornet is a chemical application to the colony, and this is a very aggressive hornet. It attacks um, local bees and wasps, and we have a proliferation of honeybees that have helped with um, pollination for our farmers and producing honey for uh, local apiaries. And there's a significant worry about the greater banded hornet attacking some of those colonies and just decimating our honeybees. And one of everyone's favorites, the little fire ant. 
These are um, aggressive feeders on small ground animals like insects, lizards, and frogs, and have been known to attack small children and small pets. Um, and actually what we're finding now is that they're in areas that are uh, frequented by hunters, so they've spread across the island and are in different grassland areas. Um, and if they're not, if, it's, if the areas aren't treated, it stops uh, insect dispersers and, and animal dispersers from utilizing sites and areas where they would, you would typically find um, seed dispersals for new growth. Um, treatment will prevent reintroduction of the, the ant to different areas or expansion. Um, we've been using a chemical application re that requires time and repeated application. But something kind of innovative that we're using for this now is um, we have boots on the ground with people spraying in the low areas, but we're working, um, we have a grant application or grant um, funding for our department and the university received similar grant funding to incorporate the use of drone technology to spray treatment for the fire ants from, the, from aerial um, positions to allow us to attack them at the top of tree um, tree tree tents or I'm missing the word um, canopies tree canopies and then we approach them from the bottom as well and then we have the brown tree snake um, which has decimated Guam's bird population but with the um, methodology methodologies we've been using to um, sort of eradicate the brown tree snake um, have proven somewhat successful, I think, because we've seen a, a significant increase in the bird population or birds coming back that we hadn't seen for years. There are birds on Guam now that um, newer generations don't even know the names of. So this has allowed our wildlife division to partner with some local um, ortho orthologists who are producing books to teach the people of Guam about the birds that we have now because I mean, my generation and those of my children and possibly even my mom's generation um, don't know what most of our birds are anymore because they were just decimated. But a technology that we're using um, with our partner from USDA uh, Fish and Wildlife um, that is pretty interesting is there's an entire machine that's been developed specifically for eradicating the brown tree snake, and it's something akin to um, a, baseball, uh, the, a baseball pitching machine. So they have these little capsules, and they're all biodegradable um, that hold tiny, tiny um, sort of like rat babies, basically, that have been uh, injected or given a small dosage of Tylenol. And these capsules are then shot out from this machine, which uh, gets stuck onto tree branches. Um, and they attract the snakes who then come and eat the rats and die a short time later from the Tylenol. Um, and as I said, everything utilized in these little capsules is biodegradable, so we don't have to worry about them polluting our forests. And they just did a second cycle of this. The first time this was ever tried on an mm -hmm. island right next to Guam called Cocos Island, there was some community um, concern, which I think um, Susan? was addressed or brought up by Susan about talking to the community um, before we try different methods just so that we can appease some of the concerns that may arise. So people were concerned about the use of this, the rats and are we hurting other animals um, and, you know, how the rats were treated, I guess, and what, how, this would, how the snakes would die. So what we've done this time is ensured that we had a media campaign before this happened to let the community know what was coming and how everything was rolled out. And it made this next, the second attempt much more easy or much easier and I didn't hear any public outcry about this process at all. Another um, invasive species which has really um, increased substantially this year and in this past, within this past decade is feral ungulates. Um, more specifically, the pigs. Wild pigs have increased in population to the point where um, part of our USDA counterparts who typically work um, behind the fence on DOD properties are now also providing services to the community outside of the fence. Um, we have depredation permits that are provided to local homeowners who need to shoot pigs that are attacking in their property. Um, and we have uh, hunters who regularly hunt deer 
more so than the pigs. So the deer population is somewhat more, uh, more maintained. Um, but with the wild pigs, they, they're digging and uprooting of trees and crops. Um, it increases erosion. And as I said, they also uproot crops, which is a, um, economically damaging to farmers and homeowners. Um, and then what both the deer and pig do is they eat um, new sprouts or new growth of saplings for young native trees. Um, and one approach we've done with the pigs, other than working with USDA, is to secure federal funding to hold uh, annual pig hunting derbies. And then we connect this with the Department of, I mean, it's the Department of Agriculture Hunting Derby, but we also connect it with the agriculture farming component by having um, what was before called Pork in the Park, where we encouraged local um, barbecue enthusiasts or cooks to come out and cook with the pigs that were shot and, you know, cooking them in a creative way and inviting the community to participate. This year we're partnering it with our annual May Harvest from the Department of Agriculture, so it's called um, From Field to Fork. And we have... Um, a cooking co a cook off competition we're incorporating food trucks and um local crops from farmers just to introduce everything or have the community come and participate in everything so we can see what just taking food from our lands and using that um and incorporating farming and the whole idea of sustainability um while working in concert with each other this is the chains of love um these vines uh, climb, they're just, they grow so quickly and climb and just canopy and cover everything in their path from grasslands to trees, um, power poles, and everything. And they block out sunlight from uh, trees that they've covered so that it kills anything underneath it, whether it's a native tree or an invasive tree, they just, it kills anything underneath it. Um, and it's gotten to the point where as you're driving down the road, this is all you see covering trees um, for hundreds of feet back sometimes and eventually start to see the size of the forest area shrink underneath it because trees are slowly dying with no access to sunlight. Um, treatments are mechanical. Tubers must be removed from the ground. Um, and that's really the only way that we've been dealing with it right now. We're proposing having a large community um, clearing of the Chains of Love by incorporating all the schools and public school children, um, any of our military personnel, and just kind of inviting everyone to a street cleaning of Chains of Love and have them stand alongside and just pull everything down as much as possible. Um, and that might be a good starting point for removing this. Um, I'm not aware of any chemical treatment for it right now that would not be detrimental to any other plants in the area. Lastly, we have the African tulip tree. Um, although it's a beautiful tree, it's extremely invasive and grows quickly, and it was brought in as an ornamental, and it produces a thick understory that shades out any native trees and replaces them. And it's actually become... Um, somewhat hazardous in one of our waterways where it's blocking anything from flowing through that as well. So we're working on um, mechanical and chemical removal that we're calling hack and squirt where you cut down the tree and then spray the stump area um, to prevent further uh, regrowth. And that is the last of our uh, invasive species that we have available for this discussion. So thank you. And thank you, Chelsea. That was uh, very interesting. I think you did a, an excellent job of just sort of highlighting her, pointing out what is at stake in invasive species management and biosecurity and forestry management and sort of the irreplaceable things that can be lost from invasive species moving in. So I think you did an excellent job discussing that. Um, so that was uh, that was very interesting. Thank you. Um, thanks to all the panelists for their presentations. Now we are moving to the moderated discussion section. We've got about 30 minutes left on this webinar, and in that time, we're going to uh, discuss a set of questions that we've worked on with the panelists in advance. And so we'll turn to that. Um, one of the first questions was about the threats that invasive species pose to islands. I think everyone did an excellent job in answering that. So I think, and um, instead, I'm more interested to learn about 
what are some of the specific challenges to forestry and invasive species management on islands? And so that's something, part of our goal through um, this webinar and part of the goal of the Biosecurity Invasive Species Initiative is to just shed, set up an information exchange between states and um, between islands and between state agencies and, and federal agencies. So that's something I would, I'm, interested to know uh, what it is that, what are your challenges, what are, what do forestry and invasive species managers on islands deal with that nobody else has to deal with, and what would you like managers in, on the mainland to know about what it is that you're up against? So um, with that, I'll just uh, turn it out, turn it over to the group. Um, is there anyone who'd like to answer that question? Um, I know that for Guam, can you hear me okay? slightly more. Okay, how about this? That's great. So for Guam, given our location um, between our um, our regional location with our neighboring islands, Asia, and Hawaii, we sort of we are a hub for everyone traveling through from Asia to any of the islands to Hawaii to reach the United States, or from the West Coast heading east. Um, um, so we're especially vulnerable and susceptible and carry a great weight um, in trying to ensure that we're protecting ourselves as well as protecting um, everyone else, that all the areas around us. Um, and it's not just the human cargo, uh, human um, potential, but the cargo as well. So everything that gets shipped to any of our neighboring islands comes through Guam, and anything that gets shipped to the West Coast from Asia comes through Guam. Um, we've had invasive species come in in everything, in every form from plants um, that people are shipping for um, ornamental purposes to aggregate that's used in construction and where we found scorpions in them at one point, um, to Christmas trees. So we have an especially high burden to bear um, as an island that serves as a hub in both directions for people and cargo. Um, so the relationships that we have um, regionally with our other biosecurity counterparts is extremely important and we need everyone's participation and input, but their input is also dependent on support from their governments. And um, part of that support is in fiscal uh, fiscal management and fiscal support. So it's hard when you have counterparts who may not be able to either travel to the island for meetings or if there's no support um, coming from the government in terms of what the councils are able to accomplish. Um, for example, with our regional biosecurity council, uh, they're working on trying to identify funding to even allow them to send out or to construct um, messaging that they can use on each island um, to communicate the importance of biosecurity and invasive species. So I know they've established, or we've established as a nonprofit organization to try to identify um, grant funding opportunities, but you know that's sort of a slow working process um, right now. So I think um, governmental, uh, support and recognition of the importance of the the regional and local councils as a whole um, would help substantially. Well, thank you, Chelsea. Uh, thank you very much. And then I'd also turn that question over to Pua and DJ. Just um, would you like to uh, add anything about what are some specific challenges that you face in terms of forestry and invasive species management and um, that maybe folks in the mainland could um, benefit to learn about? Um, similar to what Chelsea mentioned, um, for American Samoa, uh, one of the challenges for us is um, basically our geographic location. Um, I think we're the most southern U.S. territory, um, so that, make, that puts us makes us quite far away from others and you know, traveling to American Samoa is super expensive. I think it's double the cost from here from Hawaii to California. Um so 
that's one of the reasons why we're not able to send as much people as we want to to other um, conferences or workshops, especially trainings. Um, aside from that, uh, Lanternor system is another challenge. Um, some areas are inaccessible due to, again, steep, steep um, topographies um, and private land ownership or uh, public land ownership. Um, for any project, we need to get their permission first to enter their lands to do any control work. Um, so that would be, in my opinion, the main challenges for making someone. Aside from the usual ones, which is like funding to help uh, pay for the labor work to control, um, funding to help purchase any, um, you know, um, herbicides for controlling techniques or projects and so on. Thank you, DJ. And do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, so I would echo the same thing as Guam and American Samoa, but on, on top of that, um, because we are so far out, um, th just the resources we need in, to tackle these these threats, like equip the needed equipment, um, shipping costs are very high out to the island. So sometimes we just have to work with what we have on island and just be innovative and think outside of the box to try and tackle some of these uh, issues. Um, Another issue I would like much. to add on, the weather challenges, um, it rains a lot for the Pacific Islands and in American Samoa when we plan to do control um, efforts one week, it'll end up being raining and then we have to wait until the rain is out because it's it's a safety hazard. It's it's quite slippery and so on. Um, and then after the rain, there's a sunny period. By the, su by the time the sunny period reaches, we're already busy with something else. So it's just a matter of when the weather is in our favor, and aside from the weather, are all those other natural disasters and so on. Well, that really does that sound like a challenge. So, thank you, DJ. Um, and that. Um, well, I'd like. That I'd like to. Oh, go ahead. One more. Thing, that's okay. Um, this is Susan here. I'd like to add that one of the things that wasn't brought up that that I'm thinking about, at least in Hawaii, and I think it pertains to everywhere, is that. Because of the isolation, the species diversity um, on these islands are highly endemic, and a lot of times they've lost their ability to compete um, with some of the invasive species that come in, for example, the feral ungulates and a lot of the pests and pathogens, as well as even other plants. They've lost some of their competitive abilities. So already at the get-go, these systems are more vulnerable um, to invasion uh, because of that. And then once you get an invasive species in the system, there tends to be cascading effects that creates problems with other invasive species. So a good example of that is the rapid ohia death uh, right now. Because ohia is already dealing with um, competition from other plants, it's more vulnerable than it might normally be. And then thus, it's more likely to be attacked by a fungal pathogen. And when that fungal pathogen comes in, then it attracts um, ambrosia beetles or other invasive beetles that then spread um, that fungal pathogen from the native tree across the landscape. And then to further top that off, the, the non-native species are more attractive to the um, ambrosia beetle, so that makes their populations go out of control so that we have so many ambrosia beetles then to carry this fungal pathogen to our native species. So it becomes complicated very quick from what, having one invasive species problem to having a multitude of invasive species problems, all all relating to each other. Well, thank you, Susan. Yeah, that certainly does seem like a vicious cycle. So that's, um, yeah, that definitely puts a point on uh, some of the challenges. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and then our, for our next question, I'd like to turn to the, really the, the topic and the subject of the webinar is innovation and what uh, islands are doing in terms of innovation and with the U.S. Forest Service as well um, to help to um, facilitate. So we talked about the challenges that islands have. Um, what are you doing to overcome those challenges? And as you share that, think in mind too, what um, mainland invasive species and forester managers could learn from the work that you're doing. So um, 
Uh, with that, I'll turn to the crowd. Maybe we can go through the speaking order again. So uh, I could just start with Susan, and then we can work our way down. Sure. I think uh, one of the most innovative tools that we've been working with um, in the last few years, especially, is the use of remote sensing tools to help us identify how these invasive species are spreading, where the hot spots are, and then where to focus attention, where the most impacts are. So, for example, we've had the opportunity to work with very high-resolution imagery where we can actually get species-specific information in terms of plant species um, on the ground to determine where things are. And then with, for example, this rapid ohia death, again, using remote sensing tools to actually be able to differentiate trees that are dying from this pathogen over background levels of mortality. And then I know um, there's a lot of people that are using small-scale drone studies um, using aerial platforms such as drones to go out and monitor um, both in phase of species impacts as well as recovery impacts. And those are very powerful tools to show how if you are getting a handle on an invasive species issue uh, that you can actually show recovery um, over time. So I would say by far that's one of our most valuable tools that, that we've been using um, in Hawaii. Thank you, Susan. Um, Pua, uh, would you, do you have anything uh, you'd like to share about the innovation that you're working on in Palau? Um, so with, with the previous question, because we're so far away and, and sometimes we just don't have the things that we need to, to address the issues, um, I think, well, yesterday we were in a session with um, a forest health sec a session, and I just learned uh, from YAP that they use salt water to treat their felinus. So it, it's it's things like that that we learn from our neighboring um, brothers and sisters that we we can use on island with the resources that we already have, and um, and meetings like this where we, we we can meet face to face and then just come up with new ways to treat the the invasive problems we have on our each of our islands. Well, thank you very much, Pua and DJ. Would you like to share with us some innovations that you're working on? Um, some ways um, on how we're dealing with these challenges are, um, you know, we're trying to get as much as community or public involvement in our projects. We, you know. Uh, Awareness or education is a critical um, component in any of our projects. So we're trying to like um, share the effects of invasive species and what invasive species are found on island and how to control them. We share that information with our partners or um, stakeholders. Um, so that's one way we're dealing with our project for that challenge. Um, Right now, we're focusing on the little fire and, and our entomologist is just currently doing surveys for, um, as of now. Um, so after the surveying, when, once that's completed, we'll go into the control phase. Um, so right now, we're still waiting for some herbicides to reach our island. But to address that isolation issue, um, I, I I don't know how to address that isolation issue. But we're working with the government, if anything. Thank you. And thank you, DJ. And then, Chelsea, you um, definitely had a lot of interesting stuff to share during your presentation on be it drones or uh, baseball throwing machines, uh, all the really interesting stuff you're working on. But is there anything else you'd like to add about the innovative work that's going on on Guam? Um, yes. One of the things we're also using is um, GIS spatial uh, or GIS layering of some of the maps um, to determine the growth of some of our invasive species and also finding alternatives for um, or creating like an economic uh, feasibility for using some of that invasive species. So rather than just figuring out a way to sort of destroy it, um, perhaps we can make use of it in some form or fashion. 
Um, so we were looking at using some of the invasive trees as, um, or using the wood for either creating mulch for farmers or gardeners, or creating wood-based products. Um, for example, um, one invasive species that we haven't really sort of dealt with, but that's, I guess, also because it's useful and beautiful at the same time, is bamboo. Um, and it can grow and really overwhelm an area, um, but we're looking at using some of that for um, furniture or tools that people can use. And um, just finding a creative entrepreneur who would like to pick up that challenge. Um, and also, like, we use acacia trees, which are invasive, um, but we use them to recondition our soil in some of our reforested areas. And then um, they're also a good deterrent for our use as fire breaks. Um, and now we're shifting into creating another economic um, entrepreneurial opportunity for a small business person to use the wood for other purposes as well. No, that's uh, that's very interesting. Thank you, uh, Chelsea. Certainly a lot going on there. Um, and then so uh, moving on to our next question, I'm just curious, uh, as you manage forestry and invasive species, I am curious that what uh, what do you need? What do you, what does your agency need to manage invasive species and biosecurity better? And I think as you gave your presentation, several of you spoke about um, capacity and, and and funding. That is, um, I you know, as I work on invasive species, that's something I hear frequently from most stakeholders is the need for that. So if you could elaborate that, uh, maybe what kind of um, funding structures or capacity structures you need. But I'm also just interested if there's any statutory or regulatory um, fixes, how the current suite of laws and regulations are um, enabling your work on invasive species and biosecurity and forestry, and if there's any if there's any agreement on some places, some tweaks and some ways some things can get improved. Um, so that I'll just turn it out, uh, turn it over to anybody who has any thoughts on that. Hi, this is Chelsea. Um, so locally, uh, what we've done roughly six years ago that has started, or since it started to take, actually four years ago since it started to uh, be implemented, is an invasive species fund. So it's a fee that ha has been tacked on to cargo being brought into the island. Um, so the burden of the fee is on the consumer who uses shipping companies. Um, to ship their goods over to Guam, and the fee that is collected feeds directly into our biosecurity division at the Department of Agriculture, and this fee is then used to hire personnel um, and whatever resources are needed to increase our capacity at for inspections and reaction and responses to um, uh, uh, any invasives that are detected, but. We also, um, what also needs more support and manpower is our Customs and Quarantine Division because they also conduct inspections at the airport and at our port, um, our shipping port of entry. And they need an increase in personnel because they don't just inspect foreign bases, but they also inspect humans and human, um, you know, like luggage and stuff. So, I mean, invasives aren't the only thing on their agenda that they have to look for. Um, but in terms of a regional council, I think that definitely needs um, fiscal support. Um, and I just, I, what was the other portion of your question? I, I know that you were asking about laws, and so that's what popped into my mind first was our invasive species fund. No, I think that answers the question well. Uh, my question was generally um, what uh, improvements that you can think of could be done to either law laws or regulations or just um what what do you need of in any sort of sense to help manage these things better and i think you did an excellent job answering that question and Thank i would you. ask I, I would, that oh, go oh, on sorry i would think that perhaps um consideration for some sort of unified international law about the export of plant materials um and i don't know how well that can be constructed or done but I know we bring in a lot of ornamentals, and that's I think that's a substantial 
um, introducer of invasive species is just plants and plant byproducts that are shipped to our islands or through our islands. And I don't know how that would be constructed, but I, that's something that I think might help. No, I think that's an I think that's a really um interesting thought and definitely something on um, the issues of ornamentals and their impacts on invasive spreading invasive species is certainly something that's come up through the initiative before. And then um Susan Poo or DJ, would you have anything to add to that? Hi, this is DJ. Um just to add on to what Chelsea mentioned, um funding would be a great help. Um not uh not just for the personnel but also for like um, additional trainings or um, trainings or workshops with our sister islands or with the U.S. mainland, it would be um, a great opportunity to have, um, you know, other forest health managers or researchers um, visit American Samoa or people from America and Samoa visit other islands to see what they're doing so that way we can all share our resources and and tackle the issue together. Um, in terms of law or like uh, policies, um, there's actually no local law regarding invasive species in America and Samoa, but that's something um, that we, myself and my colleagues, should stress to our governor. It has to come from a uh, state level. So that's something we'll be working on or looking at in a few months or so. Great. Thank you, uh, DJ. And Susan or Pua, do you have anything to, to add? Yeah, this is uh, Susan. And I would just uh, echo what Chelsea said about quarantine. I think that's really our biggest issue. I think that we're very lax in the islands about um, checking what's coming in, and there's a lot more regulations for stuff that's going out in our case, and then that just doesn't seem right. So I think really beefing up um, our quarantine capacity as well as our detection capacity, like tool development to in improve the detection of invasive species. And I mentioned the, 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 the dogs or the canines earlier, and I think investment in these type of tools um, which could really go a long way. We have you know up to 6 million visitors a year in Hawaii, and um, it really has an impact on our islands and an Im impact on bringing in new invasive species. I think along those lines in the horticulture industry, um, really there's very little regulation on what people are bringing in. And, um, they, for example, they don't even use a weed risk assessment. They're encouraged to use a weed risk assessment, but they, they don't have to. And so there tends to be people bringing, purposely bringing in <laughs> often invasive species or just species that they want to have um, in, in their yards or in their landscaping without really trying to understand the, the potential impacts that that might have. And I think um, one thing that's needed, and we're already on the pathway to start doing this, and that's um, tackling things multi-agency because we really have such limited resources that we need to really all collaborate together. And I know Hawaii has a multi-agency biosecurity plan, and I think um, the test is this, if this is really going to be viable or are we going to be able to do this across agencies. So. Um, I think that those are some of our biggest needs. That's great. Thank you, Susan. And Pua, uh, anything to add? No, I would just echo everything that these guys said. It's pretty much the same. Great. Thank you, Pua. Um, and now we um, we have about five minutes left, so that's really only time for probably one more question, too, if we really um, squeeze it in. But so uh, there was a lot of conversation about biocontrol, and that's something that's come up throughout the initiative as well, is um, what is being done on biocontrols. And that's what we've learned through the initiative is that islands really lead the way often on the innovative use of biocontrol. And uh, But I'm just wondering if um, folks would like to talk about what it is they're doing in biocontrol and um, how they're communicating, how their biocontrol processes get approved and um, how the research gets conducted, how you communicate with um, other islands, with, um, with other agencies, and uh, how those get approved. And if there's any, anything that we could learn from that or any, any improvements that could get made as far as biocontrol, um, conducting the research and, uh, and approval and implementation. 
So kind of a broad question, but I, I would like to touch on that question before we, we finish. Okay, well I can start since since the speaker's right in front of me, but the, I, in, in Hawaii, this has been something we've really been investing in as an agency, is uh, biocontrol of invasive plants primarily. And it's quite a long, lengthy process just because you don't want to have um, impacts on other species. So it's really dependent on which what you're trying to control. For example, we're trying to control some of the um, species such as Myconia and Clydemia, which are invasive across all of many of the Pacific Islands, and that's a fairly easy one for us to do because in, in our case, there's no native melastomes or anything else in that family. But it's a matter of testing to make sure that there's no um, imp negative impacts on other plant species or its ability to spread. And so once we go through and show that there aren't impacts, then we have to go through a state process to get it released. And then you, it's also very important to do these community outreach campaigns because we've learned our lesson that if you don't do this, there actually are people that get attached to a lot of these species. So um, one of the things that I think could really um, be improved upon is when we get something in approved in Hawaii, it doesn't necessarily mean it's approved for other places and they would have to go through the same processes is my guess. Mm -hmm. And so if we could l loosen some of those restrictions on some of these and share um, our stories of what's working in Hawaii and be able to effectively utilize those at a much quicker pace in the other islands, I think that, that would, could really strengthen um, the use of biocontrol and the success of biocontrol because for some of the most egregious invaders, it really is the only solution and the only opportunity. So I know in, in the state of Hawaii, we're really talking about trying to invest in a much larger biocontrol facility, again, multi-agency, and hopefully this can include um, sister operations on our um, with our Pacific Island neighbors. Great, great. Thank you, Susan. And then um, I turn that over to the uh, other three panelists, just with a note that we've got about three minutes left, so maybe quick answers to each of those things. And uh, um, so, yeah, uh, the other panelists. Hi, it's Chelsea again. Um, I think providing support and not necessarily financially, but I mean, that's a significant component, but allowing our, we have a rigorous um, team at the department, at the University of Guam, um, and that partnership has proved just invaluable um, with the entomologists who are there, and we have an entomologist on staff at our Department of Agriculture. We're working on securing a plant pathologist as well, um, but them having the ability to bring sciences into the, into the mix have um, strengthen the, our ability to identify and use biocontrols, and these, and I think working with the SPC, um, the, the South Pacific Consortium, they've been able to reach um, across waters to talk with um, researchers in Thailand or in other areas that have may may have identified um, different biocontrols that have worked. And yes, it's a very rigorous process that they go through to be able to. Um, even access something for the purposes of research or bringing it into Guam um, just to do that, just small sample sizes, which I can appreciate because we don't want to introduce another foreign um, component into the mix that then becomes problematic in and of itself. Um, but just providing that acknowledgement of the work that they're doing and how it contributes to our successes or just the little, the small successes that we have um, has been really, I think, meaningful, um, and recognizing that we need to invest in the sciences <laughs> for our students. I mean, we, you know, it, it's not easy to come by plant pathologists and entomologists locally on our small island unless we're cultivating that from the beginning. And when we're not cultivating that, then we're working on reaching out you know, across the world trying to identify someone who can come do the work for us locally, and that's just a whole new kind of challenge. But we're always more than happy to share that information and whatever progress we've made with our sisters and brothers on our neighboring islands, and I think it's that relationship um, that has strengthened all of us or provides support for all of us you know, that we're united by our blue continent. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Chelsea. And then Pooh and DJ, in 30 seconds or less, um, do you have anything to add to your about your work on biosecurity? Oh, 
um, nothing to add. I think Susan and Chelsea did a perfect job in explaining <laughs> all of our issues with biocontrol. <laughs> all right, thank you, DJ, and thank you, Susan. And with that, uh, we are going to conclude the webinar. So thank you, um, everybody, for joining. And this is the uh, yeah, the end of the Western Governors Association innovative webinar on innovative approaches to addressing forest health and invasive species in the Pacific Islands uh, webinar as part of uh, Hawaii Governor David Ige's Biosecurity and Invasive Species Initiative. Um, thank you for joining, uh, and thank you to our panelists, Susan Pua, DJ, and Chelsea for speaking today, and also thank you to Sarah Goodwin again. Um, thank you to Sarah Goodwin from the Council of Western State Foresters and to Kevin Moss from WGA for pulling all of this together. Could not have happened without you. And um, thank you for joining and listening in um, to the audience, and I would encourage you to check out this webinar and um, all our other webinars, our workshops, and our eventual report for the initiative at the WGA, uh, WGA website. That's westgov.org under the initiatives page. And with that, we'll sign off. And thank you again. And stay tuned for more interesting biosecurity and invasive species content from WGA. <laughs>